The Book of Disquiet by Fernando Pessoa 18. With merely a kind of smile in my soul, I passively considered the definitive confinement of my life to the Rua dos Duradores, to this office, to the people who surround me, an income sufficient for food and drink, a roof over my head, and a little free time in which to dream and write, to sleep. What more can I ask of the gods or expect from destiny? I've had great ambitions and boundless dreams, but so has the delivery boy or the seamstress, because everyone has dreams. What distinguishes certain of us is our capacity for fulfilling them, or our destiny that they be fulfilled. In dreams, I am equal to the delivery boy and the seamstress. I differ from them only in knowing how to write. Yes, writing is an act, a personal circumstance that distinguishes me from them. But in my soul, I'm their equal. I realize that there are islands to the south and great cosmopolitan attractions. And if I had the world in my hand, I'm quite sure I would trade it for a ticket to Ruados Duradores. Perhaps my destiny is to remain forever a bookkeeper, with poetry or literature as a butterfly that alights on my head, making me look ridiculous to the extent it looks beautiful. I'll miss Morea, but what's next to a glorious promotion? I know that the day I become head bookkeeper of Vasquez and Company will be one of the great days of my life. I know it with foretasted bitterness and irony, but also with the intellectual advantage of certainty. 19. In the cove on the seashore, among the woods and meadows that fronted the beach, the fickleness of inflamed desire rose out of the uncertainty of the blank abyss. To choose the wheat or to choose the many sick was all the same. And the distance kept going through cypress trees. The magic power of words in isolation or joined together on the basis of sound with inner reverberations and divergent meanings, even as they converge. The splendor of phrases inserted between the meanings of other phrases, the virulence of vestiges, the hope of the woods, and the absolute peacefulness of the ponds on the farms of my childhood of roses. And so, within the high walls of absurd audacity, in the rows of trees and in the startled tremors of what withers, someone other than me would hear from sad lips in the confession denied to more insistent parties. Never again, not even if the knights were to come back on the road that was visible from the top of the wall, would there be peace in the castle of the last souls, where lances jangled in the unseen courtyard, nor would any other name on this side of the road be remembered but the one which at night would enchant, like the Moorish ladies of folklore, the child who later died to life and to wonder over the furrows in the grass like remembrances of what was to come. The treading of the last lost men sounded ever so lightly, their dragging steps opening nothings in the restless greenery. Those who would come were bound to be old and only the young would never arrive. The drums rumbled on the roadside and the bugles hung uselessly from exhausted arms that would have dropped them if they had still had strength enough to drop something. But the illusion was over, the dead clamor sounded yet again, and the dogs could be seen nervously hesitating on the tree-lined paths. It was all absurd, like mourning the dead, and princesses from other people's dreams strolled about freely and indefinitely. Twenty. Whenever I've tried to free my life from a set of the circumstances that continuously oppress it, I've been instantly surrounded by other circumstances of the same order. I yank from my neck a hand that was choking me, and I see that my own hand is tied to a noose that fell around my neck when I freed it from the stranger's hand. 
when I gingerly remove the noose, it's with my own hands that I nearly strangle myself. 21. Whether or not they exist, we're slaves to the gods. 22. The image of myself I saw in the mirrors is the same one I hold against the bosom of my soul. I could never be anything but frail and hunched over, even in my thoughts. Everything about me belongs to a, a glossy prince pasted along with other decals in the old album of a little boy who died long ago. To love myself is to feel sorry for myself. Perhaps one day towards the end of the future, someone will write a poem about me and I'll begin to reign in my kingdom. God is the fact that we exist and that's not all. 23. Absurdity. Let's act like sphinxes, however falsely, until we reach the point of no longer knowing who we are. For we are, in fact, false sphinxes with no idea of what we are in reality. The only way to be in agreement with life is to disagree with ourselves. Absurdity is divine. Let's develop theories patiently and honestly thinking them out in order to promptly act against them, acting and justifying our actions with new theories that condemn them. Let's cut a path in life and then go immediately against that path. Let's adopt all the poses and gestures of something we aren't and don't wish to be, and don't even wish to be taken for being. Let's buy books so as not to read them. Let's go to concerts without caring to hear the music or to see who's there. Let's take long walks because we're sick of walking. And let's spend whole days in the country just because it bores us. 24. Today, feeling almost physically ill because of that age-old anxiety which sometimes wells up, I ate and drank rather less than usual in the first floor dining room of the restaurant responsible for perpetuating my existence. And as I was leaving, the waiter, having noted that the bottle of wine was still half full, turned to me and said, So long, Senor Suarez, and I hope you feel better. The trumpet blast of this simple phrase relieved my soul like a, a sudden wind clearing the sky of clouds, and I realized something I had never really thought about. With these cafe and restaurant waiters, with barbers and with the delivery boys on street corners, I enjoy a natural, spontaneous rapport that I can't say I have with those I supposedly know more intimately. Camaraderie has its subtleties. Some govern the world, others are the world. Between an American millionaire, a Caesar, or Napoleon, or Lenin, and the socialist leader of a small town, there's a difference in quantity, but not of quality. Below them there's us, the unnoticed. The reckless playwright William Shakespeare, John Milton, the schoolteacher, Dante Alighieri, the tramp, the delivery boy who ran an errand for me yesterday, the barber who tells me jokes, and the waiter who just now demonstrated his camaraderie by wishing me well after noticing I'd drunk only half the wine.